Welcome back to the Fearless Future podcast. We're your host, Glenn Schwarm. And Amber Schwarm. And today we have a very motivational series coming up. This is part three of our motivated sellers. And today we're going to dive into disgusted, disaster, disease, and deserted. How inspirational is that? Sounds exciting. Before we start, however, I want to put you on the spot and quiz you. I've been quizzing you on some Gen X stuff. Is that what this is turning into? Put Amber on the spot and see if I can remember back That's that far? Like the Merv Griffin show, from <laughs> Seinfeld. So here we go. So I'm going to play a sound. You tell me if you recognize this sound. <laughs> there you go. That one's easy. That's Pac-Man. So Pac-Man was my favorite, Miss Pac-Man actually was my favorite growing up. Of course it was. Because my brothers, both of my brothers were really good at all the games that took, you had to use both hands on the controllers. And I was never good at those. I was never that coordinated. I know you'll find that very hard to believe. <laughs> my fancy wife. But Pac-Man just had like the one joystick. So I always did really, but they liked the Galaga and Centipede, oh, yeah. like where you had to do centipede, like the, the, ball, the yes. ball and the yes. controller. I, I could never coordinate all those together. Do you remember we were at an Airbnb boy three four years ago in florida yeah, in really though, yeah. Here. and the, they had the video they had millipede they yeah. had the actual like you could buy the retro game and they had millipede there i played that for hours remember i got the high score i think yeah. i had the high score in the house that day i was loving <laughs> you that you've been so proud yeah i was uh yeah so that was I, I yeah remember the video games back then people would try and figure out how to put swear words Car yeah cuss words yeah. with their initials yeah <laughs> yeah that was yeah the old ass was always kind of a, that was always a popular one out there, but there was. Then they redid that tried. on the Friends episode. Yes. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, I forgot that. I um I was thinking about video games too. We we used to have arcades right back in the, yeah. in the eighties. You go into an arcade, they still have arcades today, but they're much very more. Very different. Yeah. Very, very different. It used to be just video game after video game back then. And I remember I used to see my brother Roger up in Rochester and I was a young teenager and he went to work at Kodak all day and I would raid through his bucket. He had this giant bucket of quarters and I go to the store and I play a game. I, I don't remember. I think it was called Animal Kingdom or something. These animals would run around. And it was a joystick kind of a game. And I tell you, if you could focus on one game over and over and over again, you get really good at it. And I got really good at that game. I remember never saw it again. But man, I used to love playing that game. But yeah, I love growing up in the 80s. I thought it was just a great time to grow up. And um, you know, what's funny. Last night, Cruz was out playing with the neighbors. And he goes, mom, mom, I drank from the hose. And, and I'm like, oh. well, don't do that. But I'm thinking we grew up drinking from the hose. Yeah. And it was no big deal. But like yeah. now, even with the news and everything, it's like, I even worry about that a little bit. Like, ooh, you don't know what's in there. <laughs> <laughs> don't do that. You drink from our hose or the neighbor's hose? The neighbor's hose. So I don't know if their water's filtered like ours. I don't either. Yeah, so, so oh boy. Don't drink from the yeah, hose. Yeah, Florida but. water is not the best to be drinking if it's not filtered. So anyway, um, in the 80s, there was a song. Remember the band Cinderella? Oh, yeah. One of my favorite bands growing up. They that was there. I think I saw them live with Bon Jovi, I think, one time or maybe with Poison. I think it was with Poison. And it was great. But they had a song that was the more the more things change, the more they stay the same. More things change, the more they stay hey, the Pearl same. Pearl Jam has a song with a very similar line in it. Just to get my yeah, Pearl but, Jam plug in. But there. he doesn't sing. He just kind of howls. That's not true. Ah, He's Eddie an amazing Vedder. voice. Yeah, Don't bash on my Eddie Vedder. Yeah, I know. I know. But anyway, I uh, I love the I love the bands from the 80s. I tell you, you yeah. know, we know we started watching the new Bon Jovi. Um, like what do you call that? Documentary. Thing, yeah. It's called Thank You and Good Night. I think that's what it's called. And I enjoyed the first one. I'm looking forward to watching the rest of it. We haven't had a chance yet to watch it. But I... I I love Bon Jovi, but I found the first one kind of was quite slow. Well, because they went a little boring. Because they went over all the early, the early beginnings yeah. of how he struggled and how he worked in the which uh, I the like music all that house. stuff. Normally, I just thought the way they filmed it was a little. Yeah, I think it, I think it gets better. People say it's, people say it's really good, so I'm anxious to see if it gets better. Because now, if you remember when we ended, now episode two, we're diving into when I remember them. I actually saw Bon Jovi live at the RPI Fieldhouse in upstate New York, Rensselaer Polytech. Institute, so in Troy, and I was like third row, and it was it was his big album, Slippery When Wet, oh, yeah, just that was came an out, amazing album, and he actually flew out in the audience like he was on a on a cable and okay. did all that. And it was a it was an awesome show, and I was it was that's a pretty small venue yeah. to go see a concert at, so it was pretty great, and it was you know had no idea how big they would become, and and uh, pretty awesome. Oh, stuff. that was before they were big. They just were getting big that that. Okay. Yeah, that was in 87. OK, so that just came out and that album just came out and it was it was just it made it come out in 86. They were just making the rounds. Okay. They hadn't got to stadiums, big stadiums. I remember yet. when that album came out, it was a big deal. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it got it got really big. We were, we were one of the early tours. 
likely because they're from Jersey. So we were in New York. So okay. it wasn't too far of a journey to get there as before they went out across yeah. the world and did their thing. So pretty awesome. But so I think we should talk today. You know, this is obviously part three in our series about motivated sellers and how motivated sellers is where you actually make money in real estate. Right. And it's how we do it. And it's how we teach all of our students to do it is how do you how do you find off market deals? Because that's where the money is. And again, we're in a world where everybody says, oh, I can't find deals are too hard. But it is hard, but it's never been easy. And and to preface that, like we should, if somebody didn't see the the last episode of this or didn't hear yes, that last episode, yes. if you're only looking on the MLS, then you're really missing out on the best deals that are out there because the MLS, once it hits that, everybody else and their brother knows about yes. it. Like you have a ton of competition. The price tends to get driven up really, really quickly. Um, so the, the real money in deals is to find the off market deals, yeah. but not a lot of people know where to look for those. But when you are able to locate these off market deals, you have either no or very little competition. And by all means, if you have not, please go back and watch those episodes or listen yeah. to those episodes, whatever, however you consume this information and get that information. I think you'll really enjoy them if you're enjoying these uh, these so far. So again, I said the more things the more things change, the more they stay the same. And what a true statement that is, because motivated sellers are the same no matter what the market is. No matter if it's a bull market, a bear market, high interest rates, low interest rates, market, the real estate market's amazing. The real estate market's bad. It's, you know, it doesn't matter. They're still always going to be motivated sellers. Always. Right. It happened during COVID. It didn't change during COVID. Right. How you had to go about it changed a little bit, but things, they, they just doesn't change. And no matter what, so people have all this fancy technology today and all these ways to find people. And I'm trying to tell you, this is the basics to find focus. deals <laughs> is to focus on these types of sellers. So today, again, we're going to cover disgusted, disaster, disease, and deserted. So let's dive into disgusted. So, you know, if, if somebody's disgusted, that could be any number of reasons. Maybe they're just disgusted with the house in general. Um, maybe it needs repairs and they just aren't able to do it. So they just want to like get out from under it. Maybe they're disgusted with their partner or their spouse right. and they want to leave. Maybe they're disgusted with the town that we, they live in. I was disgusted with, with New York. New York. Yeah. I just wanted to leave. Like I was ready to go. We didn't end up selling our house. We kept it. We were in that position, but we, we were at a point where we were disgusted with the cold weather and we just wanted to leave. But people also get disgusted with their neighbor. Yeah. The, the town. Oh, sure. Cause they get, they get in spats with their neighbors yep. and towns. They get, they, be, they get disgusted and they get to a point, you know, anything in life, not anything, but many things in life get to a point where you're like, I'm just done. I'm done. That's the other D, right? I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. I'm just disgusted yep. and I don't want to do it anymore. And I think once, once people get to that point, they want to sell. I think that there's two things that come to mind. One is we've bought many multifamilies or single families from tired landlords. Yeah. Those are people that get done. And right. I'm thinking about one of our students that we helped negotiate a purchase of a rental house. And I helped them. This, we've, there's been a post done about this before. If you follow us, you'll find it on there. But there's a post where I talk with David and I'm helping him negotiate, literally helping him negotiate this deal. And I said, tell me about the deal. And he said, okay, this is a house. I can't go in it. The tenants have been there for 25 years. The guy lives, I think he lives in Florida and the house is in New York. And he said, I can't, they won't let me in the house. I can't get in the house. I can't raise the rent. I don't want to deal with this anymore. And I want out now. And I'm willing to take $100,000 for the house. And I said, here's a little, little lesson on negotiating too right here. I said, okay, so what did you offer me? He said, well, I offered him 100. I said, no, 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 no. We don't start at 100. Just because he'll take 100. That, that, that's a good deal. I said, but you can't see the house, right? And he said, right. I said, then you have to prepare for the worst. So we had to buy it what's called sight unseen. Sight unseen. And I said, so take a look at the outside. Take a look. Now, thankfully, we knew that neighborhood and we knew what houses are typically like. I said, but you may open the house. It might be a, it might be a meth house. Yeah, it might be a can of worms. You have no idea. It could yeah. be all, they, could have, they could have gutted everything on the inside. You, right. don't, you have no idea. I said, you have to prepare for that. So I want you to offer 50. And he's like, I can't offer 50. That's offensive. Yeah. So that's a whole different um, Training, episode yeah. that we did on negotiating yeah. that you can go back and watch. And that's all about how we negotiated and helped him actually buy that house for $65,000. So he picked up instant equity in that house. Turns out he picked up over a hundred thousand dollars in equity in that house. 
by finding somebody who was disgusted. Call, that one phone call saved him $35,000. Talking to me. From, yes. Talking to me. Yeah. Because I helped, he wanted I, to offer yes. 100 and yes. then you guys settled, yeah. you know, everybody he, settled on yeah. 65. He, he made $35,000 for that one, that one coaching call. But my point is the seller was disgusted. He couldn't do anything. He wanted nothing to do with it. He didn't want to deal with the, the tenant laws mm-hmm. in New York. And he was disgusted with the area. He was disgusted with the house, disgusted with the tenant. Now they own that house. It's in great condition and they get rent every month and they have $100,000 sitting in that thing in equity that's growing tax deferred, yeah. much like an IRA would or a 401k. And people don't understand that that's out there. So that's, uh, that's great. So I think, you know, you can look for tired landlords. That's a... I mean, our, our very first house that we ever bought was a tired landlord. He he had cobbed the house unbelievably. Oh the oh the rental. Yeah, the River Road. Back in two thousand three. Yeah, River Road. Twenty one years very ago. Very first house we ever bought together. Yeah. You know we've we've done a podcast on that too. We won't necessarily dive into all the details of that. If people want to go listen, but like that was a tired landlord. He just wanted to stop being a landlord because he wasn't doing it right either. He wasn't right. doing it the way we teach, where you don't have to do the landlord portion of it. Right. So so he was a tired landlord. He wanted to get out. We got a good deal. So those are, that's, again, you can understand why it's a motivated seller because they want to get rid of it. The very first house we ever did, those people were done. They were. So when I've told the story on other podcasts, but if you, if you haven't heard, I'll just give you a real quick synopsis. The, the mail carrier let us know that she saw an older couple working in a house. We went up, I ran up, I ran up the road, literally ran uh, by foot and walked in and said, do you want to sell the house? And she said, yes, we negotiated a price. We bought the house. We flipped it, made a whopping seventeen thousand dollars. They they were like in their seventies. Yes, they were in their seventies. Um, she had inherited the house, I think, from her, from her brother. From her brother, um, and she and her boyfriend, who was the biggest old curmudgeon you ever met in your life, oh, man. were working on it in like the dead he heat be, of summer. He had to be late seventies, no air conditioning. Right there, when we walked in, they were installing a kitchen countertop. Remember that. Yeah. They were trying to install us big. If you've ever done that before, it's, it's a hard. lot of work. It's yeah. awkward and it's a pain. And they were and they were in. He had to be late 70s. Yeah. He acted like he was 90, but but late 70s. I don't even know if they're still alive. And we I remember at the closing table, I said to them out of curiosity, when uh, when did you guys. Oh, by the way, let's talk about that real quick. Remember the closing table? Oh, my gosh. We said that old curmudgeon guy, at the yes. closing table started to accuse our lawyer because he, he it, something was off by like $8 on the taxes, the tax adjustment. Tax adjustment should be this. And my lawyer said, nope, that's the number. And he said, no, it should be this and this. And our lawyer goes, yeah. our lawyer goes, sir, that's the number. What do you say? He yelled at him and said something. And that's, that's the number. And, and in my office, people treat me with respect and we're going to act professional here. Like he really got in his. And then, and then leaves the room. Yeah. And, and we're sitting there alone with him. And it's us with this, these two old sellers going, I've never bought a house before. I don't know what to say now. You will, oh, he said, like, you will conduct yourself with professionalism in my office. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's what he said. Yeah, yeah. You, you'll conduct yourself. And I'm like, uh, nobody's said a word for like 10 seconds. It was like so awkward as he left. And then you finally said, hey, guys, like you, you said something <laughs> like cute. And I'm Great like, Pollyanna. I'm like, oh, my God, please. That was terrible. So anyways, but I remember saying at that same time, I think, I think it was around that time. I said, when did you guys decide to sell? And she said, the moment you walked in, <laughs> the moment you walked in. Yep. She said we're, we were she said we were done. Yeah, we were done. So that's that's an important one. So so being disgusted, being done, that's that's a big part of it. And um. You know, I think you're going to find those people through general marketing efforts. So yeah. you think yeah. direct mail, um, looking for dilapidated houses, because that's, that's not some people that are done. So sometimes like we've, we've talked before in previous podcasts about stacking motivators. Yeah. The more motivators you can stack together, the more motivated that seller is going to be. So a lot of times when they when they are disgusted and done, it's because they've had a series of other motivations that are happening that they can't deal with. And that's when they want to get out. So as you're marketing and looking around for those other situations, you want to find the one that says, yeah, my house is dilapidated. I'm going through a divorce. I just got downsized to my job and I am done with this. I got to be done. My dog died. I'm going to write a country song. Right. Yeah. I got to get out. So that's important. All right. Next was disaster. Yeah. Disaster can also be any number of things. It could be a natural disaster or just a disaster that happens in the home. You know, when, when the hurricane hit down in Fort Myers a couple of years ago, you know, there was a lot of disaster in that area obviously yeah. so investors came flocking there to to see what they could buy anytime there's a hurricane or a tornado or a flood you know or or maybe there's a fire in the house maybe there's mold maybe there's 
you know, bad well, drainage go, go in the back, house. Go back to the flood. Go back to the, the hurricane that came through. Yeah. I think that people think, oh my gosh, I better go there. The problem is you're going to go with, with a whole ton of competition. If you like competition, you're going to have all kinds of people. Because when that happened, everybody swarmed right to the to that area. And they were just inundating those people with, hey, I'll buy your house. I'll buy your house. I'll buy your house. Knowing it would come back because it's Florida. It's the right. coast. But there's a lot of competition when you go after if you if you become a disaster chaser as an investor, number one, you're operating in areas that you don't know, usually, and you're trying to make deals, you know, and you don't know the situation. It's all in panic. It's it's a very difficult thing to do with a disaster. Yeah. So we think you should focus on Your personal area, personal disasters. Right. Yeah, where right. where that happens too. There's a fire in a house. There's a flood in a house. You know, maybe the the pipes exploded. Right. What whatever. There, there's any number of things that can cause a disaster in a house. Right. So, um, what happens sometimes though is that people will get the insurance money when there's been a, a disaster in their home. Yeah. And then they just want to keep the money and move on, and they want to sell their house. Right. They get money to rebuild the house. Right. And they're like, forget it. They pay off the there's a mortgage. I'd rather go buy something not. new. Right. Yeah. I'd rather go buy something. So, so then they don't they don't necessarily need as much. Right. For this burned out shell of a house or whatever right. it might be. Or moldy house or whatever. Right. Yeah. So they they become motivated because they don't want to deal it because now they also have code enforcement. Right. Right on them. Code right. enforcement is right there saying you got to deal with this. You got to clean this up. And their tax bills are still due and yes. they just, they don't want to deal with it. So yeah, they, that, they're that ready never, to move on. That never changes. So do you remember we bought a few houses this way that had like um, in the Northeast, there's basements, obviously. So we bought a few houses that had seven, eight foot of water in the basement. Yes, I remember. The, yeah, I can think of. <laughs> there was, there was that gonna, one in this. Bring your, I, I sure oh, am. God. You know I am. You're such a pain in the ass, so, that story. So we go in this one house in Niskayuna, which was the town that uh, the Airbnb guy was from by the way yes um brian something brian chesney so we go in this one house where we're looking around you open the basement door you're headed you start down the first couple of stairs and then you hear something no, no, no. You, you, you gotta give the story a little better i start walking down the stairs you're right behind me there is literally it's an eight foot it's i was an eight, getting there well but but you but you, don't you like the, the order whole, that i set it in well you, you, you not set the story up right you're talking about that you just heard a noise you have to walk down you have to give the vi visual i'm walking downstairs and it's dark. It's dark. And there's there's literally seven and a half feet of water in an eight foot in an eight foot area. So I walked down I'm like there's water everybody. So I'm trying to bend over to kind of look to see what I can see in the water. I see stuff. All, you know, imagine, imagine all the stuff that floats in a basement, hunks of wood and furniture and an old table. And it's just it's it's bizarre to look at now tell your story so, so mind, mind you i'm leaning over <laughs> water it's dark i'm looking to kind of see what's going on and then so my big protective husband hears this sound like something plops in the water like it wasn't scuttles. just a, yeah it was more like a kerplunk something <laughs> swimming in, at me or near me i was he turns around and nearly plows me over and knocks me into the basement water oh, as he's escaping like, himself like and saving himself yeah. from the store from the that from story the, is like the big fine, bad critter that's in the basement that story is like fine wine it gets better with <laughs> age yeah next thing you know I, I was drowning you in the water i threw you as bait you nearly knocked me over getting well, yourself that out was of there. a little terrifying because i didn't quite know what it was i didn't know you were so close by me but thanks yeah. for protecting me yeah then. yeah yeah anyway <laughs> Anyway, do you remember the house we bought um, up in Rexford? That was it was that a also had like eight foot well, of that, water. In that the was basement. closer to ten. That was a they had a ten foot tall basement. Yeah, and yeah, you it, could play basketball in there. It, it was, was so huge, tall. and it was a ranch. So the so yeah. the the footprint of the house was over four thousand square feet. Yeah, it was large. The basement was four thousand square feet, and the water was in the basement and frozen. Mm -hmm. It was I I remember walking downstairs, looking around the corner. Like I walked down the first two stairs and said. This doesn't look that, right. <laughs> there was a couch. There was a chair floating. floating. <laughs> I'm like, this looks weird. And but it was you couldn't tell it was frozen yet. So I put my foot on it and said, that's ice. You got to be kidding me. I remember when the construction guys did it. They finally they, they threw some pumps in the basement and where the wa water will always find Our a way. Our house was uphill. Yes. And so water went down. It loaded up the neighbor's lawn. Something fierce. That. Yes. We looked down and it was frozen all over their lawn. It had to be drained though. I mean, yeah. there was nothing, no way we could yeah. not drain Sorry. it. Sorry, neighbors. So, so that's a disaster. Lots of just disaster. Again, there's money, there's money in those. And uh, where do you find them? So those you could definitely have certain sources like, you know, fire departments are going to know if a house is caught on fire, obviously. Yeah. Um, it, you know, the remediation companies are going to know if there's been flooding or if there's, you know, mold in the house, there's mold remediation companies. So those are definitely really good connections with those. Yeah. 
um, that, that's I'd say was is probably number one when yeah, you go about finding contractors could be too. Contractors might be might be a, might be a good source just to, to find. And driving for dollars, you're definitely going to see if a house has been on fire. For sure, you know you can you can usually tell that. Yeah, your local even code enforcement will know if the fire department doesn't want to share the information. Code enforcement will know. Look in the paper when you yeah. see fires. All that kind of stuff. That's how you'll know where you can, you know, put your efforts in. Look, talk to neighbors, find out who the owner is. Again, it's going to take some time. Don't, don't go to the fire the day after. But I just thought of kind of a new clever idea, too. Like you could get a drone and like send it up above neighborhoods and see if there's any tarps or if any neighborhood backyards are like super grown up. And that sounds crazy, know. creepy, but not a, not a horrible idea. I think you could probably do. It. I think neighbors are probably. Yeah. Down here in Florida, they might pull a gun out and shoot your drone down. But oh, yes, we had drones in our backyard. Before. Yes, I know. I know. That's interesting, though. That's yeah. that's that's an interesting concept. Yeah. yeah. I mean, take it. Take a drone. What would you do? Just fly. Pick a neighborhood and fly around it. Yeah. And just see what you can see. What would you be looking for? Uh, you could be looking for tarps on roofs because that would show you, you know, if there's been a fire, probably. Yeah. Um, or if there was, you know, obviously a tarp on a roof is not a good thing. Yeah. Um, you could see if yards are grown up, like overgrown with shrubs or trees. Maybe or- a dumpster dumpsters um you could see if uh, driveways aren't plowed if it's if it's snowing in the winter um mm-hmm. you could see you know if yards aren't mowed you know that might be a little harder to see but if they're really grown up like we've bought plenty of houses where the shrubs are now trees because and you right. couldn't even see the house anymore you know those are typically houses where there's well, some issues so instead of driving for dollars you're saying drone, drone for, for dollars, dollars. Drone for dollars. What we, a, we could coin that. That's a pretty cool idea, actually. I think that would drive the neighbors crazy, but that's an interesting idea. Take a drone around yeah. a neighborhood because you can fly those several miles, I believe. I don't know. I think you can. I, I don't know. I know the drone experts will know out there. Maybe you can let me know in the comments here or wherever, but I think you can fly some of those miles. Might be worth the investment to learn how to fly yeah. that. That's a really interesting concept. I got to say, I thought you were crazy when you first started. Not that you're not crazy. That's probably a whole different conversation, but that's an interesting idea. Droning for dollars. Well done, babe. I like it. Let's coin that. That'd be good. <laughs> That'd give our kids something to do. Go out and look, go out and look for houses. Go scoop up the neighbors. That's very interesting. Um, let's talk about disease. Yeah, disease is a big one. Um, you know, and that's an unfortunate thing, obviously, but it it happens, you know, and we're not gonna stop it from happening. I I, I think people get a little bit um turned off sometimes at some of these motivating factors because of course. they they might like, accuse you of being an ambulance chaser, whether it's death or disease or, you know, whatever, but it is a fact of life. And do you want to help somebody in a situation? And, and that's, that's one way to flip the script in your mind and, and to kind of change the narrative. Like you are helping people get out of a bad situation. Somebody has to help them. Somebody. Yeah. Or, or else, you know, sometimes it gets to a certain point and then, then people have bad credit because they're behind on their payments or, you know, they lose their house. And sometimes it still gets to that point because people don't make choices soon enough. Hmm. But if you can be in a position to help that person get out of a bad situation so that they can move on and take the next best step for them, yep. try to create a win-win for them. Don't yep. take advantage of them, but try to create a yeah. win-win. Yeah, we, we talk about these like we, we've been doing this for so long, 20 years now. We don't think much of it, but it's, it is a fact of life. Again, right. again, the, we started this episode by saying the more things change, the more they stay the same. These things happen all the time in people's right. lives. And our job really is to... How do we help them? Solution. How do, we, solution how, do we find, how do we find a solution, right? Yeah. How do we engineer a solution that's best for you? So, right. all right. So, right. So, so, so disease. So do you remember that one house that we bought? We actually uh, still own it because it's a, it's a rental property. Are you about the Mercer lady? Yes. Oh uh, yeah. That was so bad. she, she passed away in the house. Yeah. Um, I think it was in the house. From MRSA. From MRSA, which, which is, is highly contagious. Yes. Um, I'm not even sure we should have been in there walking around no. afterwards, but. I had um, flip flops on. Yeah. I remember that. And she was a hoarder. Like yes. there was a lot of stuff in the house. Yes. I remember the carpet being yes. disgusting. So you can go I, over to. Can I, can I tell the story? Go ahead. Yeah. So you should I, tell I'm, it because that happened to you. I'm walking in the kitchen and, and the refrigerator is out kind of a kind of. A like cockeyed. Cockeyed. Yeah. And, and so I had to get past that to get to the basement because I want to see the foundation. And there's stuff every place. There's, there's diapers. There's adult diapers. It was not a good situation. There's bloody there's stuff. It was just not. It was the bad situation. And I, that's why I was in flip flops. I remember going, I should have shoes on. Like this is bad. So I was really careful where I was walking. So I'm walking in the kitchen, and I had to, I had to turn sideways, and I'm kind of thick, right? So I had to turn sideways to get my chest to go through this little opening. And I'm going by the refrigerator. And I'm looking, going, what are all these dots on the refrigerator? And I look now that my face is close to, I realize. They're maggots and they're dead maggots. They're on the outside of the refrigerator 
And I know you remember why they were. Yeah, because her cats had passed away in the winter and in upstate New York, the ground is frozen. So she had put the cats in her freezer so that in the springtime, when the ground thawed out, she could bury them. Yeah. So the, those cats where there's no power in the freezer. Yeah, there was no electricity Somehow those, on. those maggots found their way in there. If a door got opened or whatever happened and they found their way in there, that was foul. Yeah. And then I think I opened it for a second. Like, what is this? And like, I'm like, oh, it's terrible smell. Get out of here. Yeah. So again, we, these bad. are not, these are not typical deals, but the, the, the nastier the house, the more money. Now we've said this in previous episodes. We should say it again. The only difference between that house and a house that looks pristine condition that grandma had, but it's outdated was $3,000 to have it cleaned out. Right. Once we had somebody go in there, clean it all out, put in dumpsters without us, we called the cleanup company and said, clean it. But you don't usually have as much competition because there's less people that want to tackle those They don't want to go in that and house. just remember, you're not the one cleaning it out. Right. You hire that out. So those houses stink, yes. but they smell like money. So let's talk about how we found that house. Because yeah. I think this is really important. I think it's a great lesson for people to it remember is. how they found it. Their, this house was, was on the tax auction list for the city of Schenectady, New York. He was in the tax auction and about twice a year, either once or twice a year, a friend of ours runs a tax auction where they sell off these houses. Now they have a list that goes in the paper. There's also a list get posted around town. And so you know when the tax auction is going to be and what the houses are. So you can drive by the outside and look at these houses. Well, I decided to do more than just drive by the outside. I knocked on the neighbor's doors and I said, hey, I said, uh, we're uh, wondering what's going on in this house. I see an auction sign in the front lawn. And they were very reluctant to tell me anything, but I, I, my technique is I always knock on the door, then I step back off the step and I say, hey, I'm a local investor and I fix houses up. This house looks like it's vacant and I try and get you guys brand new neighbors that are great. And I just wonder if you could kind of lead me in the right direction who I could talk to. And she, she finally reluctantly, after I just kind of warmed up to her a little bit, let me know that her sister lived a town over. And so... And the, and the woman had died in the house. And I said, okay. The woman's sister lived in a town the over. Woman, I'm sorry, the woman's sister, right? The seller's sister. I, we, we sent our girl that worked for us. We trained her on what to say. And she went over and found this deal. And she, uh, the woman agreed. She said, here's the problem. They owe back taxes. And I think they owed like $25,000 in back taxes. Now, now, what I'm going to tell you is a little bit sketchy. Because it's not ske sketchy is the wrong word. Risky is the right word. Sketchy is the wrong word. It's a little bit risky. And... What we did was the auction was in two days. I forgot the day of the week, but the auction was in two days. If you can bring the taxes current, then you can pull it off of the auction list. So I didn't have time to buy the house and do a full title search and everything else. So I had to gamble it. And the gamble was we put $25,000 down. We went down to the city of Schenectady. We, we made a contract with the woman who officially hadn't been given the house yet. I don't exactly oh, know. She wasn't the executive. No, executive the, 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 execu pa the paperwork hadn't happened, hadn't been filed yet. There was some, there was some confusion there. If she was even the right, rightful heir to the house. Okay. So we said, okay, we're going to gamble $25,000. So we gambled $25,000. We went down to the courthouse or the tax department, paid off that house. I made sure that it was going to be removed from the tax logs or from the tax auction, auction. rather. And they did. They removed it. We had many friends. If you remember, my brother-in-law, too, at the time, he said, everybody's, everybody's waiting to get that house. It was a primo house in a primo neighborhood. And they're all waiting. They're all licking their chops. And it comes time and it says, so-and-so house been removed from the list. And they're like, removed? Swarm. God, they got it. The swarms got it, didn't they? And we did. We bought that house before anybody else knew what happened because we paid off the taxes. Now, it took us about three months to actually close on the house, the gamble was it may not have been sellable. There may have been more liens we didn't know about on the house. She may have never been the executrix. She may have never wanted it. She may have never sold it. Now, we had her sign a piece of paper saying she would sell it. Could she have sued us in court? Sure. If she didn't want to sell it, it would have been risky. But that's a rental to this day. I don't know how much we've generated, but we probably have a good $200,000 in equity in that house. And there it sits. Yep. And we found that because, you know, the woman, it was a disease. And then it was on the tax auction. Again, delinquent, which is one we're going to cover in the next episode. But she was delinquent and disease and, and, a lot, and also done all and, that. And we're not big personal fans of the auction. I mean, we've bought a couple of houses that way, a handful yeah. of houses that way. I like to but buy like, them before the auction. One, yes, exactly. Like once, once it goes to the option, then once it goes to the auction, 
then your competition increases and people tend to overpay because it's very emotional. So if you can find it like that yeah. and, and do it before it goes to auction, that's awesome. All right. Last but not least. Last but not least is deserted. You know, people just leave the houses because they, they don't want them anymore. They don't need them anymore. They don't want to take care of the taxes. So they just desert them. Yeah. So, you know, we, we have what that one house that we refer to as the ghost house. So that house on Skimmerhorn Road in the town of Rotterdam, it was, it was vacant for at least, I think it was 12 to 15 years. It was vacant for it. And remember when we walked in, it felt like a ghost house. Yeah. It's creepy. I mean, I, we walked in there because we saw house it, it, was it was like gonna, built in the early 1900s. It was going to hit the market and, and we heard about it and to the town, the town owned it. I forgot. And someone gave us a heads up. We took a look at it. I Maybe mean, it was a realtor. I think a realtor listed it. And I was like, that house is for sale. Cause I had been trying to find out who the owner was for a decade. Yeah. And finally we, we ended up buying the house. So that house was deserted, you know, deserted house need a little more work. Wait, so did you... the town own it? Cause no, I mean, even no. if the house is deserted, people still have no, to pay taxes. I said the on. town owned it. That wasn't right. I think a bank owned it. I okay. kind of forgot who owned it, but it was, it was a, it was an organization. It wasn't a person, Yeah. but an agent listed it and that house. We actually bought it for 25 grand or no, I think it was 50 grand and I got, I got like a $35,000 credit at closing because they couldn't prove a septic system actually existed there. And it really was, it's an interesting, strange septic yeah, it system, is, it is weird but I got, I got, I, we ended up paying like 15 grand for that house. And that, that's a, that's a house that's worth close to $300,000 now. Yeah. We put a hundred thousand dollars into it yep. to renovate it, but a huge return on the investment for that. But those houses are out there. You know, I know that um, you drive around and you see those big red X's on houses. Those are houses that they've been kind of, con- I don't know if they're actually condemned or, or they're, they're marked with that big X so that fi- the fire department knows not to go in there. Right. But like, that's one way to do it. One way to find kind of abandoned houses is, yeah. is to see that big red X or to, again, driving for dollars. So those kind of houses, those vacant houses, the best way you can find those is through code enforcement. That's a that's yep. a great way because they know vacant houses, like you said, or fire departments, it's a great way to find that as well. Yep. You can also use skip tracing. If you've never heard, heard of skip tracing, skip tracing is another service you can use that digs deeper. It's like, a, like having your own private investigator. That's yeah. probably the best way to think about it. But they'll go beyond normal means to find out who the owner of a house is. And right now, even with the software we give our students, I think it's pennies in the dollar, yeah. a couple bucks maybe to go do skip tracing to find out who the owner, or if it's an LLC, they'll find out who the owner is of the LLC. If it's a corporation, they'll find out who that is so you can talk to an actual human being. Right. So you want to do skip tracing to find out the owner of those. Again, the harder it is to find the owner of a property to talk to, the better it is because you won't have any competition. Right. You have minimal competition because the harder it is, the more that most people will fall off and never make right. it. That's why, you know, it, you know, people fall off on long journeys. They just can't, they can't make it. You eventually be the, you're eventually the lone man or lone woman standing out there. If you just keep pushing forward. Yeah, and it might take you answer. a minute to find out how to do that. But like, once you learn that skill. Yeah. And everyone's different too. Right. All right. Well, listen, I'll tell you this. We, today we covered disgusted, disaster, disease, and deserted. And in the next episode of the remaining Ds, we're going to cover death, divorce, and delinquency. These are everybody's favorite subjects. Because so, they're probably the top three biggest motivators of why people sell. And it's probably where how we've bought most of our properties right. over the years at such deep discounts to make such great money right. to help Gen Xers like us pad our retirement and get back on track. Because we're tougher, we're living longer, and living longer costs money. So we got to do that. So we'll see you in the next episode. That concludes this episode of the Fearless Future podcast. Make sure that you click like if you like this episode. And episode four is coming up. So click on notifications and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss that one. Mm -hmm.